Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here today. It's an honor. Um, thank you, Ms. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about the, the human genome computation biology and epigenomics and my research at MIT. So what is epigenomics? Everything started 20 years ago when we launched the Human Genome Project, a consortium of scientists to study, map, and sequence the human genome. Um, it, it was completed in the early 2000s, and it actually raised more new questions about the genome than the ones it answered, because we found out that over 90% of the genome is known coding. That means it does not affect protein or disease directly. And that, was, that part of the, gene, of the DNA was previously thought as of, um, people would call it junk DNA, because we thought that it was not involved in any particular uh, mechanism of our body. But turns out, it really does, in an indirect way, but in a really important way. So in 2007, two new consortiums were launched by the scientific community, the Roadmap Epigenomics Mapping Consortium and ENCODE, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And their goal was to map and annotate this 90 plus percent of the human genome that was the non-coding DNA in order to find methods and utilize the epigenomic data that affect genetic diseases and uh, other de um, and genetic traits and diseases like um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and so on and even cancer. So all in all epigenomics is a very new frontier of genomic research and analysis. Formally it can be defined as the study of chemical elements that regulate gene expression, genome function, chromatin and chromatin structure in the cell. Uh, it is very interdisciplinary, and that's why you know uh, it's uh, called computational biology. So we have classical biologists, computer scientists, people from various engineering backgrounds, um, computational biologists, statisticians, physicians, and medical doctors. That they all work together to annotate and map and understand uh, this uh, known coding part of the genome, and with a longer term goal to not only understand it but also through gene editing cure uh, disease, genetic diseases, and traits. Through this technology called CRISPR-Cas9, which is probably the most exciting thing that came out of biology the last five or ten years, because it pretty much allows us to do live organism gene editing. That's really fundamentally changing how we, you know, the game, the science of understanding our body and how we, what we do with it. So the epigenome, the core study of epigenomics, is uh, is, a, is a complex heritable regulatory network based on chemical modifications overlaid on the DNA in histone proteins. It regulates chromatin structure, the, this guy, look, this little guy here, genome function and gene expression. And, and it allows us to answer questions like why a heart cell is a heart cell and not a brain cell, or how does um, a unique genome in each one of us generate so many different thousands of, thousands of different cells, different cells. And all this epigenetic information is stored as chemical modifications and cytosine bases, the little C guys here, I don't know if you can see it properly, and histone proteins, the little spool-like structures here. And the two main methods to uh, analyze, interpret, or even change and interact with those chemical modifications are DNA methylation and histone modifications. The first affects directly the DNA because, as said, the proteins attach methyl and cytosine bases here. That means they can turn on or off specific genes. Because remember, a gene is a finite sequence of the DNA. That means, for example, from here to here could be a gene. In practice, a gene spans around 10 to 110 or 30,000 base pairs, this vertical structure here, the two nucleosomes bind together. Um, so it's not that small. The, on the other hand, histone modifications affect the DNA indirectly because by attaching um, chemical marks to these guys here, these little histones, proteins detect those marks and decide if the following DNA sequence wrapped around this area, this histone, will be used or ignored, thus turning on and off our genes or changing their expression indirectly. So the, by studying the epigenome, we try to examine how and what cells do with their genetic code, what goes wrong from time to time, and how it affects disease and genetic traits. One cool thing really we can do is reversible cell mutation. So if somebody, because we do not change the DNA in itself, but it, we change how it gets expressed and what it does by the interpreter of the DNA, so to speak, we can really, uh, you know, if something goes wrong in an experiment, you can, like in a computer, hit the undo button, command Z, and change it back because you just remove those methyls guys here, or the marks above the histones, and you really have the previous expression of the DNA for the same genes. But what is really mesmerizing about the epigenome is that the environment affects it, how your life, how you grew up, really affects it and, and changes it during your lifetime. So not only what you eat or smoke or how much you exercise, 
Um, all these environmental factors do affect essentially how your DNA will get interpreted uh, during the lifetime. And not only we're passing 50% of our DNA to our offsprings, but now that means we're also passing 50% of our lifestyle genetically superimposed to our offspring. That's really you know, something to think about. So a cool metaphor to think about all this, if it still doesn't make any sense, which maybe you know, it will, it doesn't, uh, is that you can think of the genome and the epigenome as a score in the orchestra, right? So your, the genome, your DNA, is like a musical score, like the symphony of Beethoven here. Uh, the musical notes or the genetic code here always stays the same, no matter you know which cell it, cell it exists. But how it gets interpreted, or how the musician or a, or a symphony, symphonic orchestra, uh, plays it out is different. Because, for example, the London Philharmonic Orchestra plays the symphony you know with faster or slower, or with more passion or less passion or emotion than uh, the New York one. The same thing with your cells. So different cells interpret the same DNA, the same DNA sequence, and they do different things in your body. So, now let's talk about the actual uh, research process. So I joined MIT uh, last July, uh, Manolis Kalos Computational Biology Lab at CSEL, where also Constantino Daskalakis uh, is a professor, the next speaker. Um, and it's this very weird looking building, at, right off the center of MIT campus. Uh, it was designed by Frank Gehry, a very famous architect. And the, the Kalos lab essentially is the um, the, the, the most important lab that study computational biology, not only in MIT, but in the area. And we have many partners like the Broad Institute and Harvard Medical School and so on. And um, this is us uh, celebrating 4th of July. And this is Wilder. And Wilder is the key person to this behind this talk and um, the research and even my thesis. Because Wilder developed this really cool algorithm called Epilogos, Epi from epigenome and Logos from the Greek word for the mathematical concept of fraction. Um, that analyzes all this epigenomic data in a very new and novel way. Also, it's pattern padding, so I will not be able to go through the mathematical concepts uh, behind it, which also they're beyond the point. Um, but I will explain to you how it works and why it's really important and, and really cool. So, formally, Epilogos analyzes and visualizes chromatin state calls across a large number of epigenomes. Practically, in plain English, it means we rank the genomic regions, genomic loci, that are interesting and or surprising for further study. And we're doing that across the complete human genome, right? And essentially what I did is I took the, uh, the algorithm developed by Water and, exp for, and expressed it from math to code and built this web application. And you can try it out at epilogos.broadinstitute.org. And how it works is that we're scoring the amount of information in each genomic locus in each base pair, every, actually every 200 base pairs. And not only that, but also the contribution of each of these. Uh, that's weird. All right. Yeah, of these, oops, of these uh, chromatin states. So remember, chromatin is a, um, a many, multiple, many molecules binded together that, um, among other things, help pack the DNA in the nucleus and also reg help regulate uh, how genes get expressed. So we're scoring. The, the overall in, amount of information in each locus, but also how these different states, you know, their impact to, for this specific locus. So that's how we show you the most interesting regions, right? And how we show how we show it is, uh, show it is very intuitive and interactive. So something that started like this in the early prototypes, uh, uh, Water had developed as a proof of concept before I joined the team, uh, is this is Epilogos for, for chromosome one. And this is how it looks now, pretty much. I'm going to show you another couple screenshots later and explain how, what this means. Um, but essentially, here, we're just scoring the amount of overall information. And here, we're scoring, you, you'll see it later in a better screenshot, but we're also scoring what I said here, the um, contribution of each chromatin state toward the overall amount. But with this kind of setup, we're decoupling a three-dimensional information relationship. And I'll show you what it means and why it's important in a minute. So if you go on the website, it looks like this. You, click whichever epigenomes you want to compute, epilogos for, or entire groups, or all of them, and then click compute. And at the end, you'll see something like that. So this is a computation for all 127 epigenomes. And to paraphrase John Coltrane here, we start in the middle of the genome and move both directions at once, because if you can see here, right here in the blue box, we're in chromosome seven. So essentially, this is a visualization of your DNA at chromosome seven. 
And if you click that, you can go to, there's a little blue button, you can go to every uh, chromosome you want to uh, analyze the pillows for, the browse actually, because it's already analyzed, or to a specific gene. If you know what the gene, the name of the gene you want to study, you just type it and it will, will go to that direction, uh, to that location immediately. So let's zoom in on this area here. And essentially it's this area, right? So um, here, what's, well, let's just explain what, 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 what's happening here, right? So the first track is what I said, the overall amount of information and whether a region is interesting. So the higher as the spike is, the more interesting this genomic locus is. And then you see not only if it's higher or not, but also which prominent states, based on the colors here, contribute to this interestingness factor, right? So now on the second here, uh, track, which is always the all the epigenomes you've computed, and in our case is all 127 epigenomes. Um, you get to see how this information gets distributed, how this interestingness factor gets distributed spatially in the epigenomes you've selected to compute. So you can see, for example, this red guy here means uh, active transcription start site. That usually sometimes means like a, a gene starts, as you can see here in the third track. And then you see, okay, you get, you get to understand, okay, this area here is really interesting. There's a, probably a gene maybe starting. It's an active transcription start site. Uh, and then you get to see in which epigenomes this transcription start site gets expressed, starts to get expressed. And then in the third track, you see which genes are affected from that, from that locus from the, and from these chromatin states. Now, um, I have highlighted this green area here, which is a strong transcription. Um, that usually happens in a gene, right? So you get to see that here, it's like, you, it stands out. But here, in the same area, in the same uh, area of the x-axis, it's not really visible. So that means it's not really impactful. Uh, and why is that? It's pretty simple, it's pretty easy, uh, it's pretty simple if you think about it, pretty straightforward, because across 127 epigenomes, only five or so contribute to this strong transcription factor. They might do it for a long period of, of space for a lot of base pairs, but it's not really many. But if you were to study, if you were to compute epilogus only for those epigenomes here, which is probably around, uh, I guess, uh, maybe brain cells or generic stem cells, um, uh, you, this, this graph here would be a lot more greener and a lot different. So, to, um, to, to tell you about the advantage of this method, first and foremost is the speed. So remember this black and white picture I showed you before, uh, the result of the first prototypes? Now this used to take about, um, yeah, as I said, 40, maybe even more minutes. Now it takes two to four minutes to analyze and visualize a complete human genome. And we're doing this across 127 epigenomes and different cell types, right? And then you have this intuitive presentation of results, right? What those results mean in a very easy and meaningful way to understand. And due to Wouter's um, mathematical eloquence, uh, it's the algorithm and the application itself scales really easily, whether it's one epigenome or 127 or maybe in the future more. So you don't have to change the code or anything at all. The math just works. And because, of, it's a, because the, of the fact that it's a web app, there is a wide accessibility um, associated with it. So that means a lot of scientists can use it to enhance their own workflow uh, in their research, whether it's cancer studies or um, neurodegenerative diseases, as you can see here. So these are, these are current and future applications of, applications of what papers we're working on. It's really, as you can see here, suitable for both initial and advanced data uh, analysis and assays uh, and even pattern discovery. And it's really, all this is really important because epigenomic data really shades a light on cancer studies, neurodegenerative disease and autoimmune disease studies, uh, and other genetic traits, for example, obesity. And one other thing you can do with epilogues is comparative epigenomics. That means answer questions like how brain cells as a group differ from uh, heart cells or any other uh, type of cell, right? And Two other, um, no, before that. Um, so what we're really working on is to enhance epilogues with artificial intelligence and, for example, recurrent neural networks. Because instead of having the scientist browse the epigenome and understand what's going on, you can teach the computer to do it by itself. So for example, it would take a total of four, maybe five minutes at most to not only compute all the epigenomic data for the complete human genome, but also 
let the computer understand and show you the 20 most interesting regions, or for example, the 20 most interesting regions targeted to or related to a specific disease or a trait. So you can either you can do even more um, focused work. Another thing which can really help is precision medicine, which is a newly launched initiative by President Obama that tries to revolutionize how healthcare uh, is uh, uh, consumed in the United States. And uh, we can really help and, and develop a better CRISPR Cas9 Cas9 workflow because remember, if you want to edit a gene first, you need to understand what's going on there and what the gene does. So that's what we are here for. And on a personal note, I'm starting work uh, with Harvard Medical School on more epigenomic data analysis projects and specifically about the immune system. So there's a family of genes called HLA we want to study that um, you know, really is the main regulator of, of the immune system. And we're not going to port epilogues uh, for the immune system, but there are other uh, similar, so to speak, applications that we will extend just for um, the immune system. So to recap this whole you know, computational bio thing, um, come by and epigenomics are really, really cool. I would really recommend if you're either in computer science or biology or other related field, um, you know, read about it and if you're interested, just start working it. Um, because not only you're um, uh, doing computer science and really cool computational stuff and programming, but you also help advance medical research. And you're not just building an app for the App Store, which I did in the past is really cool, but you also maybe now in the future you can you know help uh, people. So it's a really good fight to fight. And the, the overall experience I had from the from the Kellis lab, which I still uh, work remotely because um, I'm remotely with because I left at uh, late September. Went back to Vienna, uh, based my thesis on this whole project, and and finished just uh, like two weeks ago or something like that. Uh, I can tell you these are groundbreaking. Uh, this are, this is groundbreaking stuff from really genius people, and they're really amazing to work with. And I would really recommend if you're an undergrad or high school student, which probably most of you are here, you know, get to know a professor in your local city or town, or and you know, find an interesting area that you want to pursue. Um, and find more about it and you know talk to them and you know try to help in the lab every once in a week for example that we even that will be fine and it's really good for a, and to understand how science gets made it's not really that mind-boggling it's really more of a kind of fun thing actually and uh, I would really really recommend it um, yeah that was it thank you and I, I guess Manoli and Roderick